Hello, good evening, and welcome to Military Images Live. I'm Ron Coddington, the editor and publisher of Military Images. Uh, the magazine is the only magazine that's solely dedicated to Civil War portrait photography. And uh, I want to welcome all of you to our Happy New Year edition, uh, our final episode of the season. So wishing all of you a happy new year. I'm also, uh, I also really want to thank you for uh, inviting me into uh, your homes, uh, into through Facebook, uh, to, uh, to share with you all of the happenings and all the goings on in the world of Civil War photography over this past year. This is, uh, let me see, we are in our uh, third season. Is that, is that possible? Um, no, sorry, we're in our, our second season. Uh, our third season will begin next year. So we have a lot of folks coming on. I see uh, Jeff McArdle. Uh, Jeff, thank you for the email. I was just looking at uh, some of your images. Michael Pissarro is here. Uh, Mark Storch, Liz Topping, Carol Coddington. Hello, Mom. Uh, Bobby McCoy, my good friend. Thanks for uh, coming on, Bobby. Uh, thanks so much to everyone. And uh, while we're waiting for a few more folks to come on, let me uh, tell you about the DC Photo Show. That's coming up. Uh, that's our next big, exciting event. Uh, thanks to uh, Doug York and myself. We're both part of the Civil War Photo Collectors Society. Uh, and uh, I know that a number of you are joining or thinking about joining. Uh, last year, we had our first show, our first Civil War show in DC. We made a whole weekend out of it with a behind the scenes tour of the Library of Congress, a night of speakers, and of course the show itself. So uh, Doug tells me that we are currently looking for folks to fill up our tables. Uh, we have an allotment of tables this year. And uh, if you're interested in selling, if you're interested in displaying, reach out to me, reach out to Doug uh, through Civil War Faces, and um, we will get you set up with uh, a table so you can share your wares, whether you're displaying or selling. So talk to Doug, talk to me. Uh, as you'll see here, the show is uh, March 6th to 8th, so uh, it'll be here before you know it. So um, before we get into uh, our event, I promised for those of you who looked at the uh, description of tonight's show, uh, I thought, wow, this is not only the end of a year, it's the end of a decade. And uh, thanks to the magic of metrics and the internet, uh, we have a bunch of data for users of our archives. And so um, I'm able to find out what folks downloaded. And from that, I can come up with a list of the top 20 stories of the decade. Uh, and that's measured by everyone who visited our archives and downloaded a story at jstor.org. That's journal storage. But before we get there, I have a little bit of the buildup here. I want to tell you, I want to make a special call to action tonight. Uh, we're looking for images of musicians. Now, uh, not only looking for images of musicians, but musicians that are posed with their instruments. Now, I've been scanning these at shows for the last few years. Occasionally, I'll publish something in the magazine when it's part of a gallery or another story, but I've been scanning these other images and haven't quite found a place for them yet. So uh, altogether, I counted them last week, and if you add up everything I've scanned, every soldier that has an instrument in hand, the total is 82. That's a lot. Um, so uh, I'm going to send them to Chris Nelson. Uh, for those of you who know Chris, uh, he is also known as Mr. Bugle. He's a frequent contributor to the magazine and uh, very knowledgeable on all things music. So I'm going to send all these images to him. But tonight I thought that I would, uh, pat I would show you a few of the 82 images of soldiers with instruments that I scanned. So we'll start out with uh, uh, the horn section. You've got uh, this union musician here. You've got these two guys. Uh, they're also playing horns. And this is where my knowledge uh, is at its limits. I know bugles 
and I know everything else. These guys are holding uh, different kinds of horns, so I'm hoping that Chris is going to help us out. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this, and I'm going to call him, he's a young man. He's definitely a teenager. His bugle is posed next to him on a table. It's a really wonderful image. Uh, another image here, this is a carte de visite. Uh, I should say that a bunch of these are from the Rick Carlisle collection. Um, you can see this soldier here. Uh, at first glance, it's hard to see the bugle, but he's got it strapped to his back. I've seen a few of these, and he has a cord that's around uh, his chest. And you can just see the top of the bugle coming out uh, behind his back. Cool stuff. Now, uh, over to the drum section. This one is, uh, if you can't see uh, on the video, the, the tinting is marvelous. Uh, you got to see a, a reddish leather uh, going over on the, uh, on the drum, holding the, the strap, holding the drum together. Some tinting going on in here with the big eagle on the drum, uh, holding a musician's sword. That is just, just a wonderful photograph. Um, this one here. Uh, you've got uh, a young man who's holding his drumsticks, uh, almost look like chopsticks the way he's holding them on his knee. Um, he's got his cap on his drum. I've got another one here, another drummer. Uh, you can see uh, he's got his uh, drumsticks on the drum head. Uh, he's got a white strap over the drum. Uh, his jacket uh, is unbuttoned. And uh, you can see a very decorative inscription of his band in metal letters on the top of his cap. Really cool stuff. None of this stuff, by the way, uh, has really been researched. Um, I've been making these scans at the shows. Those of you who have seen me behind the scanner, I know that I'm going through all the scans. And this is the point in time where I'm gathering all of them together and I'm sending to someone who's an authority to be able to make sense of all of it and tell us more. I want to round out the drum section with the only image I've ever seen uh, of a soldier holding cymbals. When's the last time you saw that? Not very often. Uh, i got a few more here to show you. Uh, we got uh, the fife section. You have uh, this man wearing his red sash holding a fife in his gloved hand. Um, you've got uh, a soldier here. Um, I believe this is wearing one of the Puritan and ham hats. Uh, he's holding his fife up as if he's about to play. And uh, one more to show you for the evening in the musical section. This young man is holding his uh, violin or fiddle. Uh, you can see that the uh, fiddle itself is tinted with a brownish color. Just absolutely superb. Uh, anyway, this is just a sampling of the images, and I wanted to see you, see them, uh, wanted you to see them before I sent them over to Chris. Uh, Chris has asked for printouts. We're going to start there so we can organize them. So I don't want you to think that this is a done deal. I'm sending all these to Chris, but uh, I want you to know that if you've got some great images of musicians with their instruments. It's not too late. Uh, you can send me a pic on, uh, on Facebook on this, uh, on this page. You can email me at militaryimages at gmail.com and uh, we can figure out a way to get the high resolution scan and I can take the pic, send it to Chris. And what we're gonna do, just so you know, is we're probably gonna break this gallery up into a series of smaller galleries and publish them over the next year or so. And um, Chris is going to work with me to figure out what those groupings ought to be. And then uh, we'll pick the images that we think are a combination of historically significant and have the aesthetic qualities that we know that all of you look for. And then we'll have some captions, some descriptive captions that talk about what you're seeing in the photographs. So uh, this is a little bit of how the sausage is made, how it goes on behind the scenes. So in this case, it all started out with making scans at the shows. I'm really open to any suggestions and ideas that you all have for future galleries. So if you've got neat things and want to talk about the potential of having a publish and putting some context around it and some historical significance around it, uh, let me know and we can talk. So I'm going to get all these off of here uh, for the moment.
And <coughs> pardon me, we're going to go um, to uh, our main feature tonight. And as I said earlier, uh, the setup here was that we're looking at the top 20 stories uh, that uh, have been published over the last 10 years of the magazine. So we're looking at 2010 to 2019, uh, the most popular stories. And I picked the top 20 uh, because I was thinking 2020, top 20, uh, it all seems to be of a theme. And uh, I thought it was really fascinating um, what folks were looking for. And I should also say, uh, the folks who were looking for this went to uh, jstore.org. I mentioned that earlier. That's journal storage. And uh, JSTOR contacted me, oh, I guess about three or four years ago now. And um, they invited military images to be part of JSTOR. Uh, and the goal of JSTOR is to preserve historically significant journals. And so uh, somewhere along the line, after talking with um, historians, scholars, the public, they uh, had a recommendation uh, that military images should be included. So they digitized uh, or scanned and then um, uh, did the searching for all 40 years worth of the magazine by now. And so they get an issue every time we publish, they add it to the collection, fully searchable. So that's the setup. And uh, now uh, let's start with the, uh, with the top 20. Coming in at number 20, hang on a second here. All right, number 20, uh, this is, uh, let me go back here. All right, number 20, uh, this is separated by war, selected images of Civil War couples and families. This ran our win winter 2017 issue, and it's ultimately a compilation. It's one of the galleries, like the musicians, this is the best of the couples uh, and families scans that uh, I made at various shows and then ones that were submitted by collectors. So we had about 20 or 25 images and um, it's number 20 on our list. So number 19, uh, you're gonna see a little bit of a theme here. Uh, Gettysburg, uh, let me get this so you guys can see it. <coughs> uh, you are making history. Faces of Maine soldiers who fought at Gettysburg. Uh, as you'll see on the front of this, uh, you've got Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who needs no introduction to all of you uh, as a young soldier, young officer, and of course here later in life. Um, this is by Tom Huntington, and uh, it features collections uh, from uh, the Maine archives. Number 18 is the Antietam album. And uh, this piece was another gallery that we did of images. I believe this is a Brian Boovey uh, image of the Confederate soldier uh, that's uh, on the cover of this piece. And um, it was introduced by John Banks. Uh, many of you know John. He has a popular blog. Uh, he writes a lot about Connecticut. He now lives in Tennessee. And um, he's also, he's recently become a regular writer for Civil War Times Illustrated. So uh, John did the introduction for this piece um, for us. Uh, number 17 is uh, a piece by John Gibson. Uh, if you don't know John, he's a prolific collector of all things Vermont, has a wonderful collection of Vermont images. And as you can see here, um, Vermont uh, identification and core badges. Uh, John put together a piece called Maelstrom in the Wilderness, the deadliest day in Vermont history. Uh, it was profusely um, illustrated with Vermont soldiers. And uh, John told the story in detail of that horrific day in the wilderness for Vermont soldiers. Number 16 uh, is uh, the earliest uh, article that appeared in our rankings. This is from our March, April 2012 issue. Uh, the ever popular Zouaves. Uh, those of you who are subscribers back in 2012, uh, and my predecessor, uh, Dave Neville, um, former editor, uh, Dave did a wonderful job amassing one of the ultimate collections of Zouave images. And this one, as you can see from the subtitle, from the collections of our readers. So uh, uh, entire issue dedicated to Zouaves that was coming in at number 16 uh, on our overall list. 
Now, number 15, Requiscat and Peace, uh, pardon me, and Pace. Uh, this is memorial photographs of the Civil War. Uh, this is the, uh, the work of Rick Lessingring. And uh, Rick is a recently new contributor to the magazine. And he's really interested in, in the images that um, we sometimes take for granted. In this case, he focused his efforts on memorial photographs. Uh, these are the images, as many of you know, of soldiers that were uh, images of them that were printed after their deaths. Sometimes they were on cards that were pre-printed with their names and their death dates. Other times they were simply a copy of a tin type, an amber type, or a carte de visite uh, that were distributed to loved ones um, before, or pardon me, during and after the war. So Rick did an in-depth explainer about uh, how these images came to be. He went back into the history that goes to Europe in the early 1800s, tied it to the rise of photography, and uh, like the other stories, it was uh, profusely illustrated with uh, a number of images. So that was number 15. Going to 14, uh, this is our first Navy um, story that appears, Life Beyond the Iron Shield. Uh, this is uh, the letters and uh, story of acting assistant paymaster William Frederick Keeler um, by Shelby Krause. It ran in the autumn of 2014. And uh, Shelby did a fantastic job uh, looking closely at the letters of Keeler. And those of you who know the Navy know that Keeler's letters are well known and they've been published before. Um, but she, Shelby brought a, a unique perspective on putting these letters in context of his experiences. Uh, and of course, the Iron Shield is the USS Monitor. So uh, number 14. Now, number 13 is uh, um, another um, contributor who has, uh, part has per or participated in numerous issues. Uh, this is John O'Brien, and uh, his story is uh, Jefferson Davis, political soldier. Those of you who don't know John, uh, he's uh, been collecting for over 50 years. He has a special interest in Jefferson Davis. And um, if you're looking for someone who knows the photographic history, of Jefferson Davis from his earliest days all the way to his death. Um, John is the individual who can tell you all about that. So in this particular story, uh, John go is in, in depth into Jefferson Davis, this particular image and how he came to be pictured in it. Uh, and as you know, some of you know, this is early Photoshop work really. Um, and John takes us behind the scenes to help us understand uh, how that all came about. Now, number 12 is another, uh, another Gettysburg uh, uh, story, and uh, it's another Maine story. This is Maine to Gettysburg and beyond. Uh, this is a collection of images, again, from the Maine Historical Society. Uh, there is a lot of really excellent research that went into these. I believe there's about a dozen photographs, um, and we're looking at uh, guys from the uh, the 20th Maine, who are in the thick of the battle, as you all know. So some really great information, personal stories, personal narratives tied to the history of these men. Number 11 uh, is another Gettysburg story. This is uh, from, uh, started with Dave Batallo. Uh, those of you know who Dave is, uh, know his collection of Virginians. And uh, in this particular um, case, um, he's looking at uh, a specific letter. He's looking at a specific moment in time and uh, involves Samuel Johnston, who had a uh, reconnaissance that still is uh, um, controversial to this day. Um, Dave owns this image. It's a one-of-a-kind tintype. Dave also owns a letter uh, written by Lee to Johnston. I believe it was in early 1865. The tone of the letter suggests that there are no hard feelings between the two men. And uh, in fact, most recently, uh, this story was picked up in uh, Gettysburg Magazine, those of you su who subscribe, uh, because that letter is such a significant piece of history. So that was number 11. Let's move on to number 10. Uh, I've talked about this image before, 
on uh, on at least a couple of shows. Uh, this is uh, from Chuck Joyce, who is one of our senior editors. He wasn't then, but he is now. Uh, Chuck has this image of about a dozen guys, um, all of them except for one, members of the U.S. Colored Infantry. Half their number were wounded at the Battle of the Crater. They wound up in Alexandria, Virginia at a hospital where they had this photograph taken. Chuck goes into detail on the research of these men and goes on to opine how they came together and why they're pictured here. Um, a wonderful, wonderful piece uh, coming in at number 10 in our overall list. Now, going to number nine, uh, I mentioned Rick Lessingring earlier um, and his story about memorial um, photographs. Rick also took a look at philanthropic photographs, another area um, of Civil War photography that is, uh, it's, it's largely ignored and even a little bit dismissed. Um, these are the images uh, of uh, men who are wounded and missing limbs. Uh, you've got women, a woman here with slave children. Uh, these are the images that were sold uh, to raise money for various causes and uh, mass produced. And so Rick helps us to understand how important these images are as a part of our culture um, and understanding the philanthropy of the day. And when you think about today, how when um, we have um, some crisis that happens, a hurricane, a tornado, and people are in need, Americans are quick to jump up and step up and pitch in and help. Well, guess what? No different in the Civil War. You have the same thing going on. So uh, the roots of that philanthropic spirit that we have in this country, uh, you certainly can look at these images and feel a common bond uh, with these women and men. Now, uh, number eight uh, is, uh, is actually a story from the editor. Uh, this is one that, uh, that I published in the September 2016 issue. It's called Cardomania, and um, it's really a social history of the carte de visite, and uh, it's subtitled How the Carte de Visite Became the Facebook of the 1860s. Uh, I go in depth to talk to you and tell you the story of uh, the rise of this paper photograph with the start of the Civil War, how it became all the rage, and on and on and on. So uh, that was number eight. Let's go to number seven. All right, number seven. Um, I found this to be a really fascinating article. It's by uh, William T. Campbell, who is a registered nurse. It's called Overwork, Undermanned and Indispensable Hospital Stewards of the Civil War, illustrated with some great images that show the variation in uniform details uh, worn by these stewards. And uh, William did a fantastic job of helping all of us to understand that these guys that are wearing this uniform, these stewards, um, these are talented chemists. Uh, they were druggists. Uh, they were trained. They were tested. Um, and so they may not have been on the front lines, although some were, um, but they played a really critical role uh, in healthcare during the war time. So this is number seven. Coming in at number six, we're getting close here, getting close to the, the five. Um, is a piece by Ron Field. And um, I dare say that this is one of the articles that, one of the stories that I quote most often um, when I'm interacting with folks. It's Battle Shirt, a field guide to unusual patterns of Civil War shirts. The first thing I talk about is uh, Battle Shirts is really uh, more of a modern invention. This is something that we use today to describe shirts like this one here worn by this young man. Uh, the ones with the trim, the ones that don't look at all like their standard images, um, they're really um, hunting shirts. And uh, there's a couple of references to them being battle shirts during the war, but they're really hunting shirts or blouses. Uh, it's not until long after the war, until we're all here today, where battle shirts come of light. Anyway, uh, Ron does a great job in dissecting battle shirts and talking about how they came to be and showing a bunch of examples uh, of what they look like. So moving on. Uh, now we're getting down to the, uh, the top, really the top five. And uh, number five is the second appearance by uh, Chuck Joyce. 
uh, in our overall list. Uh, if I can say up here on the on the uh, the mount for us, ah, it wants to get out. Um, this is called uh, Reluctant Hero, Otis C. Billings and Cowan's first New York independent battery at Gettysburg. Um, it's a very tragic story of the fate of Otis Billings and the position that his battery was in uh, towards the end of the battle. So Chuck Joyce brings his critical eye, his research skill, and of course, a wonderful example uh, of a portrait from his collection and other supporting images to illustrate this article. So we did have a lot of Gettysburg material that uh, showed up um, uh, in our top 20, and uh, this is certainly one of them. Now, number four, voila, is uh, Ministering Angels, Union Nurses in the Civil War from the Chris Ford Collection. If you know Chris, uh, you know he's one of the super friendliest guys uh, in the collecting community, and his passion for nurses makes him unique because he began collecting nurses at a time, and not only nurses, but uh, documents, pamphlets, everything related to nurses. He started collecting decades ago um, when most of us were not even really thinking about uh, these images as important to our history and our, our identity. Um, Chris did, started collecting them. And uh, in 2014, am I right about that? No, spring of 2015, <coughs> we published the piece. And I will admit to all of you that I was incredibly nervous about featuring a nurse on the cover of military images um, because we had a steady diet of having soldiers with muskets and all that. Um, put a nurse on the cover and uh, the response was overwhelmingly positive, as was this piece. So coming in at number four is uh, nurses. Coming in at number three is this piece from our autumn 2016 issue. So uh, this is following the colors on James Island. You get this here so you can see it. Um, this is a story of uh, Cabot Jackson Russell of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry, a young officer uh, and his tragic story. It's vividly illustrated in graphic details taken from period accounts. Uh, really unusual, uh, the level of detail about the specifics around his mortal wounding uh, during the battle uh, James Island, and the person who wrote this uh, story is Scott Valentine, and uh, Scott has been contributing uh, stories to military images for, gosh, for probably 30 years or so now, and uh, he's something of a mentor to me uh, because he inspired me with his writing style, this idea of really trying to tell the story of a soldier. So uh, Scott is one of the best at it, and uh, he was recognized with the number three uh, story. So got one more Gettysburg uh, piece coming in at number two. And uh, this is called Honored Dead, Haunted Survivors. It's actually the first uh, Gettysburg gallery uh, that we did under my um, editorship. And um, Harold Holzer, who many of you know, he's a Lincoln scholar, uh, he wrote the introduction for this. And um, Harold brings his very unique perspective on uh, the battle, on Lincoln's role, and um, this serves as an introduction. Hard to see up here is the Gettysburg Address, um, uh, that famous image of uh, Gettysburg and Lincoln is in the background. So uh, there's a whole collection, about 25 or 30 Gettysburg soldiers that are on the pages that follow this, each tells their story. And in this case, most of them, uh, I believe all of them in fact, were casualties uh, in the battle, killed, wounded, or prisoners of war. So uh, Harold Holzer in Gettysburg comes in at number two. Now, we're down to number one, and uh, here it comes. There we go. Uh, by a large margin, uh, women on the home front, their essential roles during the Civil War. Uh, this is by Juanita Leash, who is well known to uh, perhaps many of you. Um, she's written extensively. This almost doesn't want to stay, but let's see what we can do here. Um, she's written extensively on women uh, in the Civil War, and um, she put this piece together to uh, help us. It's actually a 
primer, a primer of sorts to talk about women and illustrate it with many images of women. And uh, as I mentioned at the intro to this one, it was extremely popular by a very wide margin. And um, to me, I think it speaks to the idea that um, as we begin to, uh, as time passes, and the baton passes from generation to generation, the interest in history is growing beyond some of those traditional stories that we all grew up on and know of Union and Confederate soldiers. We're now beginning to look at other narratives. And I think you see that moving through um, all top 20 here, um, the hospital stewards, the philanthropic photos, the memorial images. Um, these are all snippets of the social history that intertwines with the military history of what's going on. So this may give a little bit of, uh, adds a little bit to something I talk about, the idea that what is the military images? Uh, where is that line? And frankly, um, I think that line is shifting. Um, I think we have to start looking at other images, not just the soldier who was in battle, to get an understanding of the impact of the war on, um, on our lives today, on, and of course on the lives of the individuals who served and the outcome of uh, the war and beyond. So um, that's it. This is our top 20. This is our end of the year. So I have to say again, a very big thank you to all of you for tuning in this year. This is the conclusion of our second season. Uh, I've loved uh, every show, and I'm so delighted you could be part of it. Um, I hope that you'll tune in next year. We'll probably be back uh, in a couple weeks, and um, we'll have the latest on projects that we're working on, various developments in the world of Civil War photography and researching. Of course, we'll be sharing your images, your stories, your requests. So uh, keep the email, the posts, the texts, uh, the calls, and uh, all the communications coming. And again, I want to wish all of you a happy, happy new year and uh, blessings and um, positivity in the year ahead. So thank you so much. Have a great night. Bye-bye.